on their way. Um, before we start the meeting, uh, there are a couple of updates that I'd like to provide members. The first relates to Councillor Shabir Pandor, who resigned as leader of Kirklees Council with immediate effect last night. Um, can I take this opportunity to thank Shabir Pandor for his support over the last two years? that I've been mayor for his role in securing devolution to the region. Uh, he's been a champion for Kirklees and West Yorkshire, including through his leadership on inclusivity. And let's not forget, he was one of the few, uh, only I think, Gujarati leaders of a council of that size. And he took that responsibility to um, talk about EDI and to champion inclusivity. Um, across everything he did, and also his leadership on economic growth. He also led the council during a really difficult time through the pandemic and difficult economic circumstances. But as they say in my old profession, the show must go on. And Kirklees will be now selecting a new leader who I look forward to working with as we continue to work towards creating a West Yorkshire that works for all. The Deputy Leader, Councillor Cathy Scott, is focused on local issues in Kirklees this morning and is unable to join us today. Um, the second update I wanted to provide members is about the legal challenge to the proposal of closures of um, ticket offices by train operating companies. Ticket office and station staff are essential if we want our railways to be accessible to everyone. They offer advice, they offer guidance, sometimes simply just that friendly face to people who may be socially excluded and vulnerable. The current plans would impact the most vulnerable in society, including disabled and older people, with many ticket machines at train stations outside of London not being accessible as they are cashless. Of the 467 Northern Rail stations, 449 have cashless ticket machines. And that's why I'm determined to challenge these proposals any way we can. From 19 ticket officers that are going to be staffed, we will end up with only three. That will be Huddersfield, Bradford and Leeds. Um, the combined authority members were kept informed of the decision taken under delegated authority by Ben Still, our chief exec. But I want to take the opportunity to put this on record. Um, uh, we've joined with other mayoral combined authorities in Greater Manchester, Liverpool City Region, South Yorkshire and Cambridge and Peterborough to challenge the lawfulness of consultations on ticket office closures. On the advice of King's Council, we've written a pre-election protocol letter to seven train operating companies, including TransPennine Express, Northern Trains Limited and LNER, setting out our belief that this type of consultation that they are using is inappropriate for changes of this scale and sets out further course of legal action if the consultation is not halted. We have seen an extension of the consultation to September, but that is not um, what we're looking for. This consultation should be scrapped. The Rail Delivery Group, on behalf of the train operators companies, announced that extension to the 1st of September. It's unclear whether it this extension will allow for the proper legal process we think the operators should have followed to take place. So, of course, we're waiting for further details. We're yet to receive a substantive response from the train operating companies to our pre-action letter. We've been told to expect this early August. Obviously, we'll need to see their full response before deciding whether to pursue the next steps of the legal challenge alongside other mayoral combined authorities. And as ever, I will keep CA members informed of the next steps between meetings. Okie doke, let's move on to the meeting itself. So, um, Ian, can you confirm any apologies, please? Uh, yeah, so we have apologies from Councillor Jeffrey and Councillor Holdsworth. Uh, Councillor Goldston is attending for Councillor Holdsworth, uh, and I believe we are expecting Councillor Morley, uh, who is not here yet. Um, we've also had apologies from Councillor Pandor, Councillor Scott, and Mandy Rudyard. Thank you so much, Ian. May I also take this opportunity, please, to welcome uh, Felix Kumi and Pofo, our new Director of Inclusive Economy, Skills and Culture. And it's your first CA meeting, so you are very, very welcome. And everybody, be kind to Felix. It's his first meeting. Um, so thank you so much. And um, we waited a long time for you, but um, I'm so delighted you're now in post. Thank you. So item two, uh, declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest they wish to declare? in any item going forward? No, thank you. Um, item three, exclusion of press and public. I've not been made aware there are any exempt items today. Item four, minutes of 22nd of June 2023. 
Any comments or questions on those minutes? We're happy to confirm they're an accurate record. Thank you. Super. Moving on to item five. Uh, this report notes the revisions made to the West Yorkshire Investment Strategy through the annual review process, and that's attached to Appendix 1. The investment strategy is one of our key documents that helps us prioritise our investments. It's important that this document continues to reflect the current economic climate and align with our new plans so the documents reflect the missions in our newly published West Yorkshire Plan 2040 and continue to provide us with flexibility to invest well in those things that will help us drive forward our economy. The report doesn't seek funding approvals for any individual projects and concerned only with the investment strategy. So may I invite Angela Taylor, our Director of Finance and Commercial Services, to add any further information and then if members have any comments they'd like to uh, raise or questions for Angela. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, a, a very thorough introduction there to it. As you said, this is something we've had in place um, since 2021. Uh, it has been updated once before, so you, you're seeing it again um, on, on a further occasion. It has had some minor updates to reflect some of the changes in the last year, so it's refreshed and updated to recognise some of the changes in year, to broaden out a little bit some of the investment strategy, some of the investment priority definitions, to ensure that we're able to respond to the issues that have been. Um, being considered by the combined authority over the last year. So paragraph 210 onwards summarises those changes. There is a bit more of an emphasis on equity, diversity, inclusion, um, including a, a, a new focus on ensuring that there's an equality impact assessment at the first stage of the assurance framework for any projects coming through to us. Um, paragraph 217 summarises the investment priorities as they now sit. And as Mayor explained, we're not looking to allocate funding at this stage. That's a, a separate process, but this is just about ensuring everybody is comfortable with the um, six investment priorities, which have been um, agreed in the, originally by this, this committee, recognising um, the MED priorities and the priorities of our local partners. Um, probably leave it there if there are any questions. Um, I see the, high, the, the changes are marked up in the... Um, in the appendix for you to see, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. And I'm also pleased to see the focus on health outcomes. Um, health inequality is too wide across West Yorkshire, and working with our inclusivity champion as well, um, we're hoping to tackle that um, uh, uh, as much as we can uh, uh, through investment, skills, jobs, and training, and so on. So, any comments? Yes, uh, Councillor Lamb, and then Councillor Galton. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Chad. Just uh, like some reassurance and comments about how we make sure the voice of children are captured through these. As someone who's chaired scrutiny in Leeds for quite a few years, um, it's important it adds value and colour and richness to the decision making. Um, there's nothing specific in here, but perhaps if it could be addressed through the equality impact assessments, I'd make sure actually really focusing on capturing the voice of children as part of the decision making. Thank you so much. Great suggestion. Let's take that away. Councillor Galton. Thanks, Mayor. Um, two things. Uh, I'm really um, concerned that, as a board, we're here to make sure that we're reviewing and, and uh, uh, making sure that policies are offered rigour uh, in our assessment of them. So it concerns me when the messaging gets changed to something which I find is difficult to measure. So we were, spoke, we were building a better West Yorkshire before, which I think a lot of people can associate with making sure that we're delivering on housing and physical infrastructure. The new um, catch line is a brighter West Yorkshire that works for all. And I'm just wondering how we tangibly measure brightness when we're measuring our success in delivering that as a priority for West Yorkshire. Um, because I, I'm having difficulty myself thinking about how that's done. Uh, and then secondly, I just wanted to endorse what the Mayor was talking about in terms of uh, the health outcomes being really important for us. Um, and I'll, I'll bring it up a little bit later on because in some of the decisions that we make in our investment programme, we might actually have potentially an adverse effect on people's health through the uh, schemes that we introduce infrastructure-wide. Um, but it also indicates that we might want to 
as a combined authority, seek to take on extra powers in this area, as has happened in Greater Manchester. So I'd be interested to know if we are working towards that. Thank you very much, Councillor Galton. Brighter, you'll see from the West Yorkshire plan, there are um, targets in place for 20, 2040. It's really clear and detailed, and there are strategies underneath each of these missions. So um, I'm very happy to share more detail that's already in place so the public can be very clear and hold us to account on what Brighter means. Uh, brighter, happier. Their emotions, but they're absolutely backed by rigour and data. And when it comes to adverse impact on health, Nobody wants to do that. Um, if you have examples of where you feel that's going to happen, please do raise those with me. Um, and regarding deeper devolution, we are currently not um, uh, asking government for health devolution. We have our bid to be a trailblazer. We are working in lockstep as leaders across the region. And the single funding settlement is absolutely our priority because that's where we're going to make a difference. I don't know if um, Angela or Alan would like to pick up any of those points. No, nope. lovely, thank you. So are we happy to approve the revisions to the West Yorkshire Investment Plan? Lovely, thank you. Let's move on to the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, item six on the agenda. This provides a further update on the progress made on implementing uh, West Yorkshire UK SPF local investment plans since the spring. And this includes core SPF, Multiply program, you'll know that's about maths and um, uh, uh, and it has been a challenge and the rural fund. Um, as I say, Multiply has, a top, has been a top-down program directly from the Treasury. We know the intentions are good. Obviously, we want our citizens to be more numerate, but the design and the management of the program has been poor from the outset. Despite this, we've been successful in improving 2,000 people's math skills across the region, but sadly we've had to return some funding back to the Treasury, despite repeated requests to allow us to roll over funding and to work with MPs to get them to support us in a letter and still government have asked for it back. We want to improve the skills of the people of West Yorkshire. We know how to do it. Um, give us better time scales and we can deliver. Was slow, the government was slow to get funding to us, and the management is exactly the sort of Whitehall control that we need to move away from. We'll strive to make a success of the programme in the coming years and remain committed to developing new and innovative solutions to address this long-standing challenge of mastering maths. This paper also seeks authorisation for the Chief Executive to progress work undertaken on the final UK SPF Pillar 3, which is long awaited to support people and skills in West Yorkshire. It seeks approval of the themed areas for investment so officers can finalise an invitation to bid to be published by the end of September in consultation with myself and the Chair of the Employment and Skills Committee. But I would say that one of the um, concerns that have been raised with me about this process of UK SPF is that it's clunky, it's, tr it's hard to navigate, um, it's hard for community, particularly that have no resources, the bidding process. I, I, we absolutely need to ensure that smaller organisations are ex aren't excluded because of minimum bid requirements, etc., that are set out. This money needs to go to the right places. Government have made it incredibly complicated and hard, and I've been challenging officers to make it easier and to have another look at how we do this. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Alan Rees for further details, and maybe you can address that point in particular before opening up the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Mayor. So um, we've made uh, good progress in terms of uh, contracting the uh, overall allocation. So roughly 60% of the 68 million has already been contracted. Um, if I could just update on where we're at with um, Pillar 2 before I come on to Pillar 3. So... The Pillar 2 invitation to bid, which is the business support piece worth nearly £12 million. We have run the process for organisations to bid into that, and um, those applications are going to be considered by the local partnership group, which contains representatives from councils and a range of regional stakeholders um, next week, before bringing those back to the combined authority for approval in September. That leaves the final strand, which is Pillar 3, which is people and skills, um, and just to remind um, uh, the command authority that this is all this is defined by government. Um, so we have uh, previously the command authority has previously agreed that we would allocate 14 million pounds to the people and skills um, call. 
and the government um, in, under the rules of UKSPF previously have required that we can only allocate money to that pillar for one year for 24-25 which of course creates some delivery challenges because we're, we will be seeking to contract with uh, a range of providers and for them to then deliver in a 12-month period. So we are uh, working hard to um, get in place that bidding process so that we're able to contract with the providers in good time for them to start delivery next April. So what's proposed, and this has all been discussed with the Employment and Skills Committee and aligned with both the investment priorities that are set out within the investment strategy and with our overall employment and skills programs, is for that skills and that skills um, money to be allocated firstly towards Employment West Yorkshire, which is a program that's already um, underway, running, working with the five um, through the five councils. Um, and then there are three areas where we would seek to enable uh, other organisations to come in and deliver for us. So the first is the work and health programme, which would be to help people in households um, and uh, to remove uh, barriers to work uh, created by poor health. The second is the community grants programme, um, which would be to support those furthest from the labour market. And I'll just come back to that point in a moment to address the, the, the question the mayor raised. And the third is on youth unemployment, um, which will be to secure a provider who can help work with partners to support um, our work with de the Department for Work and Pensions um, for youth hubs across West Yorkshire. Um, and as I say, there is, a, there is a significant delivery challenge with this given that we only have 12 months and that relates to the point the Mayor raised about the constraints that are um, placed on us by government with this fund. So there are some challenges which we are in discussion with government um, on about this and are also working through solutions with uh, officers across the region. In terms of the question about the, 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 um, the accessibility of the funds to smaller organisations, absolutely this is a challenge which we recognise and I'm just going to say a, f a few words about how we're dealing with it. So we're trying to strike a balance um, here between the delivery of larger regional programmes uh, and supported by a number of smaller local programmes. And in particular, it's worth um, reminding the combined authority that nearly half of UKSPF has been um, allocated to each of the five local authorities to run hyper-local programmes. And there are significant opportunities in that funding for small local community groups to, uh, to access money. Um, that said, you know, there is less under UKSPF than there used to be under um, ESIF and there are some difficult choices to be, um, to be made. So, um, so there are opportunities for smaller organisations in the Communities in Place pillar which is run by the five local authorities. Um, in terms of the People and Skills pillar, um, we're seeking overall agreement today to the, the shape of those, those four areas that I described earlier. It's worth mentioning the Community Grants um, pillar four million pounds, where our approach to that would not be for the combined authority to run the bidding process, but for us to contract with a grant provider who would then run it for us. And we would, and the, the, the kind of the rules around that, including the minimum amounts, have not been nailed down. We would look to do that in the next stage, taking on board the feedback that has been received from stakeholders across the region. So we would seek through that process to address the issue around accessibility for um, for smaller organisations. Um, so hopefully that answers the point, but very happy to try and uh, answer questions. I think also the challenge is about making sure that people know this money exists and that, that these opportunities are there for them. Is there any work we can do to make sure that the call goes more widely uh, and not to our usual channels? So we are, uh, we have a, uh, the development of a website underway which will help, although clearly development of website is a quite a common answer to how are you communicating and not necessarily uh, the most effective. We have, a, um, we have a distribution list of hundreds of stakeholders across the region, people who previously accessed European money, for instance, um, that we regularly send these calls out to, um, and we can certainly look to try and um, extend uh, extend that and my understanding is that over the last um, year or two it has uh, grown to over a thousand actually so we are pushing it out to lots of um, lots of organizations across the region and clearly the local authorities are doing the same thing in their areas as well um, and uh, and always happy to have further organizations added to it I think also the people that have been delivering the mayor's cost of living um, crisis money they should know as well the deadlines and 
and identify people who need support to bid. Um, and also, uh, Fatima Khan Shah, the inclusivity champion, should be given these details to say at every opportunity that this is this is for you. Uh, absolutely, and of course, um, the community grants program um, that will be launched under skills so under the skills pillar isn't open yet. So at the point at which we do, we will uh, will absolutely um, use those use those channels. And where there are existing channels through, uh, for instance, the local authority um, run funding under the communities in place pillar, um, we are pulling together all of the information about how to access those funds so that it can all be communicated out comprehensively. Thank you, because the last thing we want to do is give money back to government uh, that we can use here. And I, I do know that the multiply scheme was so tricky because there's people so far away from even getting into a classroom to learn about numeracy that they need that support that could be six months to a year support um, m moving through programmes and so on. So very, very frustrating time for us when we could use that money. Okie doke, any questions? Councillor Galton. Uh, I think it's a really, I think it's a really good, uh, really good point, and we will build that point into the uh, invitation to bid as a requirement. But certainly, the, a lot of, uh, uh, well, as you know, our focus is absolutely on those areas of furthest away from opportunity, getting support to access opportunity. So that's why um, uh, ensuring that we have a, a decent boss network is one of my priorities because the only way you can thicken the labour market is through skills and good transport. So those two together will help our communities. We have this money, we must make the most of it and widen out the offer. Councillor Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just another one on the, on the rural fund. There's a bit of a theme here. Um, it says in 2.10 you're working with a small number of key rural partners to try and promote this further. Would you be able to send us round or let us know who the rural partners are? And is there a link that you could send to members on the board so that we can share it out in our communities as well so we can make sure it's uh, out uh, as much as possible? And on the, the multiply, um, really concerned that... Uh, over 1.4 million is being taken from the uh, West Yorkshire going back to government on this when obviously there is a lot of people need literacy skill, uh, numeracy skills. Um, what's even more concerning is it, it's sort of saying that one of the reasons for the, for the delays and the problems is the, the lack of the local authorities um, having relationships with schools which seems a bit crazy because I always thought our local authorities work very closely with our schools uh, and our academies across, the across our districts. So 
I don't know, we've got a few of the leaders here. Were they aware that there was a problem having relationships with the schools and have they been dealt with on individual authority levels? Or Councillor Paulson, if I just may say, it's not about the relationship with schools. This is parents. So and so, in but in parents, you have to build the trust in order, as I said, they are the furthest away from going to a numeracy class. So it's, it's building opportunities, for example, to do a cooking class where there is some numeracy in that cooking class to then move through to another class um, that might then be a, a multiply. So this isn't about poor relationship with local authorities. This is absolutely about the timescales given to us by government. They give us the money late. We had a year to deliver it and to deliver at particular standards. When in the outreach work, we're doing all we can, flat out, trying to identify people who could benefit from this money. And let me tell you, I am absolutely sick to the back teeth that we have to give this money back. And we lobbied and lobbied and lobbied to keep it and extend the, t the time frame. We know we can use it. We know there are people that need it. And government said, we want that money back. Our, our local MPs cross party wrote a letter. They advocated for us. And I, I, I'm hopefully that you might write a letter and say this is absolutely wrong and it's mad that we know we can um, we can use this money in West Yorkshire. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in, Alan. Uh, thank you very much. On the on the first um, on the first point, absolutely on on the rural fund. So um, we're working with organisations like the National Farmers Union, uh, the Yorkshire Food and Farming Rural Network, etc. Um, and we will absolutely send around um, that list of rural. Uh, stakeholders and um, and send information about the opportunity to uh, all members of the um, all members of the combined authority and just to um, build on slightly what the mayor what the mayor said um, yeah multiply landed uh, in the middle of the school year very difficult to engage um, uh, parent ask ask teachers to then work with parents halfway through the school year it was so there were a, there were a number of challenges to do with the the, the timing. Thank you so much and uh, Councillor Scullion. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed in the Share Prosperity Fund so far. I mean, we're very grateful to have it, but certainly Calderdale is 60% of the European monies that we had, and we're making the best of it. And as the mayor said, it came late. Um, you know, I mean, waiting, waiting, kept asking, you know, where is this money, Share Prosperity Fund? Where is it, you know? And we've been left with a part year, basically, in order to try and get things up running out of the door and sadly the timing meant in Calderdale certainly that some projects had to close because there was no guarantee projects that were absolutely in the right area and needed that funding had to close because there was no guarantee of the new funding stream so there were some I'm sure unintended consequences of that I just wanted to to say that actually in terms of the rural work um, I think only Wakefield has actually been allocated. I think only one application has gone through so far. There are quite a lot of others, um, I think, lining up um, uh, in terms of the rural fund. It would be good to see uh, a future report, how that's working across the, across the boroughs. Um, but really, really pleased, really pleased to see it. I think my main point, Mayor, though, coming back to the initial point, is capacity the capacity of the community organisations who are making this work on the ground and organisations like schools and so on, a very short notice to put these things in place, the capacity of us as local authorities to try and manage that and the capacity then of the combined authority to, to manage some flexibility in terms of light touch and proportionality in terms of the, some of the, some of the, uh, the rules. For um, Calderdale, I think it's just over two million for pillar one actually and i know that's a lot of money but nonetheless proportionally in terms of other schemes it is a relatively small amount of money within this particular landscape and so understanding our capacity to to manage some of that um i think we've already had the discussions about making sure it's appropriate then for the future thank you councillor scullion and it deepens my resolve to get further deeper devolution because this does not make sense it's uh, it's taking capacity out it's um dancing to a tune we we don't necessarily get the best outcomes and we give money back it, ma it makes no sense we know how to do this stuff give us the powers and money to just get on with it thank you 
Okie doke, so are we happy um, to note progress? Lovely. And can members note the recommendations of the UK SPF Local Partnership Group from its meeting on 15th of June 2023? And just while I'm on that point, I want to thank the members of that group who have to wade through pages and pages of phone book size of paperwork, and they do it for the love and the dedication for West Yorkshire. So thank them for their hard work and diligence. And thirdly, can members confirm they approve the funding envelopes of the four calls and authorise the Chief Executive to finalise the invitation to bid document in, consult in consultation with myself, the Chair of the Employment and Skills Committee, so we can then get it published by mid-September. Thank you all so much. Brilliant. Uh, right, moving on to item seven, approval of combined authority returning officer. And this is preparations for the 2024 election. I can't believe it's coming round again. Um, it's, it's absolutely flown by. Um, the proposal is to mirror the admin arrangements are put in place for the 2021 election. Tom Reardon, the local returning officer for Leeds City Council, thank you, is in the chairs on the side. Thank you for agreeing kindly to take on the important role of the Combat Authority returning officer with support from Ben Still as one of his deputies. Uh, ben, anything f further to add? Amen, I don't think so. I think it's all clear for the members who are to approve. Thank you. Are we all happy to agree Tom's appointment? as the returning officer. That's a, it's a sad day for you, Tom, I'm afraid, but um, you're going to be our returning officer. And uh, obviously, Ben, as deputy, thank you all so much. Terrific. OK, moving on to item 8A, investment priority three, creating great places and accelerated infrastructure. Now, this report uh, provides details of two schemes that are recommended for progression through the assurance process. And can I invite Liz Hunter, Director of Policing, Environment and Place, to outline <laughs> excuse me, the two scheme, uh, schemes for consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so to start with the Employment Land Accelerator Fund, um, this is £2 million for us to um, really get into the employment sites pipeline across the, across the region. So what does that mean? That means that we want to work with our district partners um, and others to identify employment sites um, that we really think need um, investment or, um, or detailed work to help bring them forward. We've already talked actually earlier about good jobs and employment sites create hopefully um, good jobs. So what we'd like to be able to do is use this fund, um, like I say, to, to work with partners to develop out a list of which employment sites to work with. And it's been really great to work with the Place Housing and Regeneration Committee. Um, they provided input into the criteria for that. Um, so we're using that to, to, to determine the sites. Um, and then we'll also use the funding to do things like feasibility studies, site assessment, master planning, kind of market analysis, to really help think about what the sites need to bring them forward, hopefully for the private sector to invest in or at least for them to be ready um, if there's any other funding which might be needed to, to help bring them forward. Um, that's the Employment Land Accelerator Fund. The second scheme um, also in this paper is the Lankwaite Enterprise Zone in Wakefield. Um, and what we're seeking for, for your agreement today is funding um, to basically enable us to bring forward that site. So it's a site that the Combined Authority already owns. And the money that we are looking for your approval today would help us to buy the land to, to build the road build the road and do the site remediation um, to then enable us to, to continue to pro progress that site thereafter. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, Councillor Lamb, Councillor Galton. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, on the first item, on the economic case, it says the scheme is expected to deliver good value for money, which is excellent, but how is it going to do that and what, what are we measuring? Thank you, Liz. Great, thank you. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to look at um, the early stages of site development. You're, you're right, and particularly when we're not giving you a list of what those sites are. I think what we're looking and have based the assessment on is thinking about evaluation of other, of other, um, of other things that we've done. So when we look at the economic um, potential of these sites, and like I say, what we've, we've agreed the criteria with place committee, so the strategic sites, the kind of where the location will be, etc., is then recognising that if we can unlock them, the potential that that has. So, for example, thinking about the jobs that might be created, um, the, uh, the kind of the added GVA to, to places when we unlock sites. But it's fairly difficult to do at this early stage. So that's why the assessment doesn't get into much more detail than that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Lamb. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
yeah, so it's sort of a wider point, uh, and I'm, I'm quite new, although I know the, the mayor didn't ask anyone to be kind to me when it was my first meeting. But, um, uh, the, the wider point is when, when do these things come back to the board so we can measure success to see what's going well and we should do more of and what's not going well um, because there's an awful lot of money being handed out here um, for some very good projects and good outcomes, hopefully, but surely one of our duties is to make sure it's actually delivering. And when we say it's going to be good value for money, that we measure and challenge whether it was or not, and we should do more of it. Liz. Um, yeah, really good point. So we've had something similar on, on housing. So we've had a housing revenue fund. Um, we're just doing the evaluation of that at the moment. So we'll then bring the results of that, and we'll look to do something similar with this fund so that we can measure it. It is something new that we're doing as a combined authority. So some of this is to test it and trial it and see and then, as you rightly say, whether it's something that you want us to continue with or not will depend on that evaluation. So happy to bring that back now. Thank you. Ben. Um, Councillor, just to kind of add to, to, to uh, Liz's answer, in, in the papers for each project and programme that's taken forward, and I'm just looking at page 99 of the pack, there's what's called an assurance pathway, and that tells you what the proposal is for how the project gets taken through and the decision, the accountability and the decision-making for that project. So if at any point you're, you, you want something to come back to the combined authority, the point is to challenge that element there because that's where the delegations are made to committees or to officers um, that mean it wouldn't come back to the combined authority unless it exceeded certain tolerances. I hope that helps. Thank you. Always brilliant on the technicalities and very helpful. Thank you. Councillor Galton. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm interested in the criteria that you were talking about that the subcommittee had put together um, because the priority is called creating great places and accelerated infrastructure and I just want to make sure given that the one distinct scheme which is highlighted here is predicated on actually being owned by the combined authority and I assume is one which is going to be fed by people arriving to work in a car as opposed to by public transport. Um, is the criteria actually associated with particular places, or is it just associated with um, an asset management exercise whereby local councils identify the bits of spare land they have and then hope that through investment jobs might be created, as opposed to people being encouraged to live and work in a particular community? And therefore, are small-scale um, accelerator projects going to be introduced? And how do places, i.e. communities, get to put their hand up and say, oh, we'd like you to consider a scheme that we've thought of as opposed to council economic development officers? Well, Liz, that's quite a question. Um, it's maybe a bit more theoretical and uh, potentially needs a longer answer than a committee about place and sense of belonging and ownership of investments and so on. Um, I hope that you could be reassured that the place committee are absolutely focused on not just job creation, but making sure that places are great places to be, to start a business, to raise a family. But Liz, I don't know if you want to come in on any of that. Thank you. Um, so the place committee have looked at the criteria and they are interested in um, our spatial priority areas, which is something that the, the combined authority have agreed at previous meetings. Um, we're interested in um, probably larger sites, so not necessarily some the kind of pockets of small sites, but again, thinking of this at a regional level and the value that we can bring thinking about scale and size, but just to reassure you in terms of location, we are really interested in sites that are located close, close to transport infrastructure, such as where our mass transit corridors are, um, kind of major rail infrastructure. Um, and so that is definitely part of the kind of criteria that the place committee had. And if just on the, on the length weight, I recognise that the site, last time I visited, I did go by a train um, and, and then walk from the train station. So it is possible. Uh, uh, Councillor Morley. Taking all the jargon and everything out of the report, we're talking about one of our poorest communities in, our, in West Yorkshire that 
has never actually got over the 1980s and the pit closing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a lot of pit villages there, South Ensel, South Kirby, Upton, Emsworth, where we have massive unemployment. And I do welcome this. I do welcome this investment comes this area, much deprived area. And actually, while right, it has got some very good connectivity in that area. It needs to be better, as we all know. <laughs> it needs to be better. But I do, I, at the end of the day, I welcome the point, it's much needed. And certainly on that site, the Backstage Academy has been an incredibly valuable resource for local young people going into the music industry and fantastic outcomes for into, straight into jobs. And some of them don't even complete the course because they're snaffled by people coming from all over the world and then taking them on tour. So it's, a, it's an amazing um, training scheme there. Okie doke. So are we happy for the two schemes outlined to progress through the assurance process? We, yes, we're agreed. And the indicative uh, approvals of the Combined Authorities Funding Contribution, full approval of the Combined Authorities Funding Contribution for delivery and development costs, and approval of future assurance pathways and approval routes. And the recommendations set out in the report. Happy to agree? Yes, thank you all so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Liz. So moving on to investment priority five, delivering sustainable, inclusive and affordable transport. This provides details of five schemes recommended to the CA for progression. And I'd like to invite Councillor Hinchcliffe as chair of the West Yorkshire Transport Committee and then Melanie Corcoran, director of transport policy and delivery to outline the schemes for consideration. Thank you, Councillor Hinchcliffe. I'm just gonna pass over to Melanie for the details, if that's okay. Yes. Why not? Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Um, so the first scheme is Levi or Levy. So this is the local electric vehicle infrastructure scheme. We've been awarded funding by government over three different um, funding pots or three different schemes. One is, is a pilot scheme. One is to then do a phase two. And the other is to look at capacity funding. And that's within the combined authority and the local authority partners to be able to deliver this work. So in total, the grant award is over 17 million. Um, the aim of the project is to target areas that do not have um, off-street parking um, so that we can look at EV charge points in those areas that are less profitable potentially to the, the private sector. So while we are looking to um, utilize the 17.142 million from government, we are also attracting a private sector element to this scheme as well when we contract with suppliers and, and providers and therefore we expect the total scheme cost to be at least 20.6 million but it could be as much as 32.6 million depending on the the level of investment from the private sector and we are proposing at this stage to approve this strategic outline case and then each project will come forward with the detailed business case and in the meantime, we propose to allocate the capacity funding across the combined authority and the partner council so that we can start working up these business cases and start deliver the, um, the programmes. Just on that, thank you, Melanie. Um, I think there's something really useful about devolution that when we get this amount of resource and investment that we can try and squeeze as much out of it as possible so i've tasked the teams to look at how we can set up skills training for maintenance of these ev charging points because there will be a job opportunity there and also the companies that are uh, bidding um, into this uh, scheme for the money to build them are they paying the real living wage um, so can we can we make the most of this investment uh, to make sure that our young people are ready for the job opportunities and that those employers are helping us with our inclusive growth ambitions. Yes, Councillor Galton. Thanks, Matt. Um, I wanted to understand better what the criteria for success is here because it's recognised that um, the majority of households still cannot afford to buy an electric car because they are um, more expensive than a standard vehicle. However, uh, you want to put your investment for electric vehicle charging into the areas where you hope it will deliver the greatest modal change from petrol to electric vehicle charging. Um, that would indicate that it's less likely to happen in 
poorer inner city areas, but more likely to happen in outer areas where income is higher. So it's a difficulty for us as a combined authority because you want your investment to be inclusive and therefore encouraging as much as possible those people with, who are less off to achieve the benefits that we hope everybody can have in a brighter West Yorkshire. Um, but if you want to get the maximum number of electric vehicles delivered, this might end up getting delivered in richer areas. What are we doing to encourage, for instance, access to electric vehicles through things like car clubs, which might enable those with more limited <coughs> incomes to enjoy the use of an electric vehicle? Thank you. Car clubs are part of our plan. Um, uh, uh, Sorry, Jane, Jane was like, yes, they are. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Um, and uh, Melanie, I don't know if you want to address those points, but certainly um, if you have no drive, you are not going to think about charging, thinking about an EV vehicle. This is why it's for communities that have no drives, it's on street charging that's really important. Melanie. Yeah, I mean, the, the intention is this, this would address some of those issues in more deprived areas where they don't have their own driveway. Um, but I do accept that there are some areas that are more affluent that still don't have um, off-street parking either. Um, so the, the schemes will be developed with the local authorities. We'll look at making the, the maximum impact there in, in those deprived communities. But at the end of the day, this funding is not to give a financial incentive to help people to buy electric vehicles. I think in terms of carpooling, we are looking at that, and that is, is one of the projects that, that we're developing at the moment in terms of, of you know, helping with our wider offer to encourage people to use uh, electric vehicles. Thank you, and let's not forget government have also banned, they're gonna be banning petrol vehicles by 2030, so we've got to make sure that all communities are ready for the change. Uh, Councillor Morley. I think it's about putting some future proofing in there that we always complain about that we don't want to put infrastructure in place to start with. And that's, to me, this is what we're doing. We have massive areas in Wakefield, Castleford, Stanley, Outwood that do have, don't have any off street parking. Uh, so I really do welcome this, like Drew, for that we're getting the funding there to, you know, before we're going to lose the petrol and diesel cars. And, and it's just for clarification, it is the sale of petrol cars uh, from. Uh, from uh, from 2040. Uh, from 2030. From 2030. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, I need my glasses to read at that distance. Um, sorry, uh, Councillor Paulson and then Councillor Galton and Councillor Lapp. Thank you. Um, just a few bits. Do we have a bit of a starting point? Are we working with the local authorities on, on the numbers here? You know, the ballpark, the number of residents or properties that don't have off street. Um, drives etc that they could install charges on so we know where we're starting from and it is some of the funding going to be looking at different ways to actually bring it in different pilot schemes I've seen obviously at local government uh, conference and things different organizations with very different solutions to this um, because I, I know a lot of people talk about street lights and we'll just plug them all into street lights well you know, if you've only got two street lights in a very long street, um, it's just not going to work for everybody. That so, are we looking at different solutions and maybe piloting this as part of this the funding, and um, and exactly? I presume the capacity and the capability funding is the same thing. They're not different things. Uh, and exactly, what are the local authorities going to be doing with that funding? Thank you. To reassure you, we're a data-led organisation, so we will have the data to drive um, our decision-making about where these go. But, Melanie? Yeah, so we are working with local authority partners to, to set that baseline. Um, what are the areas that we're targeting? Where will we get the, the, the schemes to stack up? And we, are, we, we have one and a half million that's been awarded as pilot funding to look at different ways of doing this. Um, so we will utilise that before we start the phase two schemes and, and look at the results of that. Um, so that is, it's very important. Thank um, you. Yeah. So, uh, Councillor Lamb. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I just, I feel there's a lack of detail in that. I think that the aim <coughs> and objective, the money is welcome, the goal is welcome, but it's just understanding how this is compatible with other strategies and priorities. So, for example, in city centres, we're trying to, discourage people from using cars at all. Um, 
are we going to be targeting those localities? How does this work in places where there are conservation areas, heritage assets? Does it apply where there are unadopted highways? And that's the barrier for, um, for people to be able to use electric vehicles. That's quite a common thing around West Yorkshire. Um, it, it just, I, I'm not, I think the, the aim and the amount of money potentially is enormous. I'm just not really clear what the strategic objective is and how we make sure it's compatible with, with our other conflicting priorities. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, so in, in terms of the strategic overview, we are currently revising the local transport plan, which will set out the higher level strategy and, and the, all, looking at all of those levers around electric vehicles, around parking, all, all of that. So, so that is coming. We are currently waiting for, for government guidance to be issued so that we can then produce our local transport plan. So there is definitely that strategic overview. In terms of the detail, this is a, what we call a strategic outline business case. So it is high level um, by its nature. Um, this was what was put together to release the funding from government. Uh, we've then been able to do the initial assessment on that strategic level. But what we're proposing here is that then each of the business cases that comes forward for each of the projects within this programme comes, comes forward with more detail. So there will be more detail that, that comes along. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Uh, Councillor Galt. Yes, thanks, Chair. It, 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 the question is being asked now because you're setting the criteria for how you're going out to the private sector. I'm assuming the private sector would want to invest in a street where they might potentially get five customers as opposed to one customer. Um, so therefore, if we're not enabling people to access electric vehicles in poorer areas through things like car sharing, then those streets aren't going to end up getting chosen. Or they are going to get chosen, but the infrastructure isn't going to match the demand. And we need to think about what is our role in West Yorkshire in creating a market whereby the price of electric vehicles reduces because we enable the demand to go up. And that might mean that the street with five potential customers needs to be prioritised in the first instance to enable the price to come down for people in other areas to access those vehicles as well. So I, I just think it's very interesting, given our inclusive um, commitment, that we look at that and recognise that as we make decisions. Thank you for that comment. Uh, appreciated. Ben. Um, it's only to come back, if I may, to Councillor Paulson's earlier question, because I, I, I don't think the paper, as it stands, does include the context of how many charging points we feel are needed across the whole of West Yorkshire, um, and indeed considerations around the, the grid's ability to supply electricity to those areas where it's needed. So I'll ask Melanie through this comment to just provide a bit of a note round so that we can provide that context, because I know it does exist and you transport for the north and done some work across the whole of the north mapping EV requirements. And the challenge is there, can the grid cope? Well, yeah. We need to understand a little bit more about that, don't we? <coughs> Okie doke, so are we happy to approve the five schemes outlined above uh, through the assurance process? We are agreed. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Melanie. Moving on. That was just Levi, was it? Sorry, apologies. Let's approve Levi. We've not had yet. That was uh, quite swift, wasn't it, that item? Melanie, on to the next item. Yeah, okay, so the, the next one is the Highways Asset Management and Enhancement Programme. We've also um, linked in with that the Off Highway Walking and Cycling Network. And there's also a further government award that includes Pothole Actions Fund. So we've tied all that together. Um, this is a five-year program that is primarily funded through CRSTS, which is the Sustainable Transport Settlement. And um, this is for funding for the rest of year two, which is this current year and year three. And the intervention, the types of interventions that you will see are set out in paragraph 4.50. So... Um, and, and there's outputs there at 4.49. So it's things like carriageway improvements, footway improvements, highways drainage improvements, uh, street furniture, off highways walking and cycling, and street lighting improvements. So the, the things that you would expect to see as part of the highways maintenance block uh, previously, which is now part of that new transport settlement. So we're proposing that the funding, uh, that we enter into funding agreements 
as identified in the recommendation section with each of the five local authorities to deliver these activities. Thank you. And I know that it's very much needed from all our local authorities. Potholes is a, a recurring issue for so many of our citizens. Yes, Councillor Galton. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's a very quick one. Uh, in terms of our uh, modelling that we discuss with the different constituent authorities, how much do we take into consideration um, parking and the dangers of pavement parking in terms of schemes which come forward? Because in an era where we're encouraging people to leave their car at home as much as possible so they can access cycling or walking or public transport, uh, we need to ensure that our streets have the capacity to deliver the level of parking which that requires. So it, is that something that we're encouraging local authorities to come forward with? Melanie? I think in the interventions that we're delivering um, in the other funding programmes, um, like the, the Transforming Cities Fund, um, the Transport Fund, and the, the new schemes within CRSTS, we would be looking to do that within those schemes. So you create a better environment upon that street or along that corridor. This is, is primarily aimed at highways maintenance. So this isn't particularly addressing that, that issue, but we would expect to see that coming through in new scheme design. Um, so it is tackled, but in a different way. Councillor Lamb. Thank you, Mayor. Um, more money for highways is always welcome, and highways improvement. Um, my question is, do we have the capacity to deliver the improvements? Um, and our, my fear is we end up doing this instead of doing something that was going to be done. When I talk to our highways officers in Leeds, where they're 18 years behind schedule on highways maintenance, um, they tell me money is not the issue, capacity is the issue and you could give them all the money to fix all the roads they wouldn't that 18 years wouldn't come down very quickly because they don't have the people the resources to actually deliver um, so it's great that we've got more money going in what is the actual impact going to be and are we going to find that schemes that were going to happen are now delayed because these get prioritized instead we absolutely need to focus on skills as well that's why skills deep further devolution on skills is a priority Melanie. Yeah, so my understanding is we, we don't have capacity issues with delivering the highways maintenance. We do potentially have capacity issues in designing new schemes and then bidding for new funding and delivering some of those schemes. Um, but as far as I'm aware, the capacity issues are not part of the highways maintenance work, that we have separate teams that within our local authorities that will lead on this. Thank you. Ben? Um, it was only to respond to Councillor Gulton's point about pavement parking. So you're probably aware that the government has recently run a consultation on pavement parking and I guess we wait to see what they're going to say because it is a tricky issue um, that because of the variety of road spaces, the variety of pavements, etc. Thank you, appreciate it. On, on that point, Mayor, can I ask, has the combined authority taken a position on whether you'd like to have pavement parking um, outlawed for our area as it is in London? Well, you all know how nuanced it is in some communities where you can't get the bus through unless somebody goes on the pavement. It's, it's, it doesn't work. So um, I think um, we're not going to take a position. We're going to wait for government and see what they say and then uh, deal with each community as it comes up. Well, I guess I was going to give a more cautious answer in that I'll just check whether we did respond to the consultation. Or not. I, don't, I don't recall a, a response, um, primarily because we're not the highway authority, um, but uh, we'll just check with our teams. Okie dokie, thank you. So moving on to safer roads, I'm really pleased that this is on the agenda. This Vision Zero has been a priority for me to try and um, lower the numbers of seriously injured and de uh, deaths on our roads. This investment will make a difference, hopefully. Melanie. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, we've, we've got a five-year programme here with 25 million over the five years. And, and as you say, we're looking to address the emerging action plan that is coming out of the Vision Zero discussions. The types of things that we'll, we'll be doing in terms of the interventions are traffic calming schemes, junction improvements, traffic management schemes, pedestrian crossings, um, average speed cameras, um, speed management schemes, cycle infrastructure in some cases, um, 20 mile allowance lim limits, and also looking at some of the signage as well. So 
the typical things that you would expect to see, but targeted within each local authority area. So the local authorities are working together to develop the strategic outline case, and then they will have their own list of, of priorities that they are then delivering on, on their patch. Um, but collectively, it's the strategic outline case for years two and three, which is this year and next year. Thank you, and I'm pleased that we've given some money to the organisation BREAK to support those people who have been hurt um, in traffic instances because for some, your life falls apart after being hit by a car and that, who is there to support you? So um, I'm pleased that we've been able to work uh, with them to try and support those victims and survivors of uh, harm on our roads. Okie doke. Yes, Councillor Lamb. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I doubt there's a single politician Where this, are you telling me someone has to do something on, on this road? Is there the opportunity within this scheme to be proactive and look at preventative measures <coughs> rather than just in isolation focusing on accident re reduction as a justification? Melanie. We will work with each local authority area and, and they will identify priorities. So there is the potential to look at that and, and we'll take priorities as, as put forward by the local authorities. So we'll, we'll work closely with them. Yes, Councillor Hinchcliffe. I suppose the more money they have, the more you can get down that list, can't you? Obviously, you have to go to the ones that are most dangerous first uh, before you can actually go to the ones that don't have any accidents at all. So I suppose the more money we had from government and we can generate through the combined authority, then the more we can do that. I think we'd all applaud that. Councillor Lamb. So I, I think it would be very helpful to have a steer from you as the mayor to say actually you would welcome that opportunity to give communities a bigger say um, in how money is spent in their areas and to, and to actually support the priorities they identify locally. I, I, I'm sure many of us have had that frustration where we can see an accident is going to happen if something's not done, but it's not prioritised and it's not... It's about what you do with what you've got, not just always saying we'll wait for more money. I think it would be very good to know that we have that steer, that with this fund it's clear there's the opportunity to be proactive. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. I hope that you are, um, are encouraged by my steer to make safety on the roads a priority and in, in so much as asking my Deputy Mayor to chair the board and actually reinvigorate um, vision Zero across the region. Uh, that is my steer for the strategic vision, but of course local authorities and councillors are the ones that deliver on the ground. Thank you. Okie doke. We're happy to approve? Lovely, thank you. So moving on to Active Travel Fund, Otley Road. Thank you. Yes, this is Active Travel Fund, Tranche 3. It's the A660 Otley Road, and there are interventions here from uh, St Mark's Road, which is close to the university through to Shaw Lane in Headingley. There are further projects that are along the A660 corridor, but I think they're further out from, from Shaw Lane in, in Headingley. Um, so initially, there were temporary um, cycle ways and um, temporary um, interventions that were made as part of the active travel tranche one and two that were made during COVID. And the proposal here is to make some of those permanent and to also make further improvements along that particular route. So we're looking at five kilometres of segregated cycleway. That's two and a half kilometres on each side of the, of the main road. Um, it's to obviously encourage cycle trips and walking trips. It's to halve the injuries that over a five year period after completion, um, it's a particular hotspot, which we've just been talking about, uh, reduce co collisions, increase the healthy street score so it's not just about the number of, of accidents it's about some of that proactive stuff as well um, five major intersection changes that design out conflict between general traffic and vulnerable road users will be looked at additional pedestrian crossings uh, 22 side road treatments that give priority to pedestrians and cyclists so quite intensive um, activity along that stretch um, to, to promote cycling and walking and to encourage people to use the bus so there'll be the, the removing of some bus stops and consolidation of others so that it makes it easier for people to get on the bus when there's a cycle track there as well. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Gold. Thanks, Chair. Can I refer um, members to page 156 
4.104, which is to do with the appraisal summary. It's a very, um, very heavy paragraph, which I had great difficulty understanding. Um, and it's basically saying, well, our methodology is a bit outdated um, and we don't know that the benefits that we hope to get will actually be got, but actually we think they probably will be. Um, which is not entirely reassuring, um, especially given that this has been a very controversial um, proposal. It represents something like two-thirds of Leeds's entire spending on active travel infrastructure. And it's also associated, associated with another very controversial scheme further up the same transport corridor. Um, and there are some assumptions made around safety. And I'm, I'm referring back to my earlier uh, statement there around, I hope we don't ultimately affect people's health in, inadvertently through trying to improve the infrastructure we put in. So for instance, there's big concerns around the cyclists being segregated from motor traffic, which makes the cyclists safer. However, at, at many points where bus stops are, the cyclists are then mingled with pedestrians. And with all of the problems that we've had very recently around e-bikes and safety, there is a, pro a potential here that we will be putting off pedestrians from actually walking down that transport corridor. Um, and so in enabling cyclists, we might be disabling another section of the active travel community. And I just wondered if it was worth re-evaluating before this goes further forward to, to make sure that a, a cycling investment isn't actually undermining another part of our priorities as a combined authority to get people out of their cars. And it also potentially might discriminate against buses because they are still commingled with the traffic and it's only when they get to a junction that they're actually able to go further forward. So there are problems with it. I just thought I'd mention that because I know there's a very, what's the word, a very active resident um, concern in the area. Thanks, Mayor. Melanie. Yeah, just, just on the economic appraisal, there are quite strict methods that we need to use to, to make the economic case. Um, the, the data is imperfect um, because we've got a model that was working pre-COVID and obviously now the whole world has, has changed. Um, the, that was partly the purpose of introducing active travel rounds one and two, to introduce some temporary changes to see how they worked. And, and look at those. Now, we don't have, we can, we can factor that in in the economic case, but we are currently waiting for an updated Leeds transport model, and we don't have that. And we've, we've made some temporary improvements that we have reviewed and measured that have made uh, you know, positive impacts. And the, there's a choice between, do you make that permanent now and, and make the improvements at the junction so that it's easier for pedestrians as well as cyclists. Um, what it actually says further on in, in the paragraph is that um, the disbenefits to bus users are not considered to be applicable at, at this stage or not considered to be significant enough to hold the scheme up, as it were. Um, so we have considered that. We are still waiting for the model, but we'd have to wait some time longer and, and pause the whole thing. As we know, we've got inflation pressures. So once you've got a scheme designed, if you're able to go, you will be able to get that scheme costing less now, whereas if you postpone it for two or three years, it will cost more. So it is weighing up all these things, which is why it's in the report. It is part of the appraisal summary, and it was something that was taken into account and still felt that we should recommend this scheme for approval, taking all of that into account. And often some of our challenge is that we, don't, we are too slow in acting and I think sometimes you have to take a view that it's better to get on with it. Um, ben, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you. Just to add to Melanie's point, there, there is an, a, a national body now called Active Travel England who essentially are providing engineering standards and advice on these kinds of schemes. And my understanding, Melanie, correct me if I've got this wrong, is that this scheme was on a number in this active travel 
round that pass that threshold. So, so they, they are kind of Active Travel England approved. Um, and Active Travel England would say that that means that they ad adhere to the current standards. But as Melody says, and, and the mayor has said, there is still a lot of learning as to the impact of these schemes and the, the, the appraisal system mitigates against them. Uh, so we're having to work in that context as well. Just to say, Active Travel England are very um, impressed with the work that we've been doing in our region in this space. So um, it's good to get their endorsement as well. Councillor Lund. Thank you, Mayor. Forgive me if I've missed it as I get used to the, the papers, but what, what consultation has been done? Melanie. Yeah, I mean, the consultation on the scheme will be done by the scheme sponsor. So the consultation will, will be done by Leeds City Council. It may have been during the temporary arrangements. It may have been more recently. Um, I'm not aware of the detail, but Leeds officers should be able to provide that information. We'll, we'll send you a note. Uh, yes, Councillor Galton. On, on, on that note, Mayor, it, the, the whole value of devolution is that you don't just get endorsement from national organisations. You also get endorsement from the community that's meant to benefit because they're meant to have fed into it. So that's the only reason why I raised the concern here because it feels like this, the, the situation has progressed faster than the scheme has and it needs to catch up to reality. Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Happy to give you a note on the consultation that was done by Howard. I know they did it online, in person, in paper and things like that. But I'm happy to get you a note on those details. Thank you so much. Councillor Lam. Thank you. Going forward, can we try and make sure those things are included in the, the agenda packs? And I mean, I, I cannot support this scheme. I think it's a mistake. Um, I think if you ask the people of Headingley and Leeds how they'd like ten and a half million pounds spending to improve active travel opportunities, they'd come up with a hundred better ideas than this. And I, I would support going back to the drawing board, doing some good consultation. I'm more than happy to be proved wrong if the people of Headingley have overwhelmingly said this is what they want. I'm very familiar with that community. I'd be very surprised if it is. Um, I, th I, think, I think this is a mistake. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. Let's um, we'll take a vote on it. Who, we're happy to approve this scheme. Um, and abstentions? And against? Thank you. It's passed. Thank you. Okay, moving on to zero emission, uh, emissions bus regional area. Melanie. Yes, thank you. It's Zebra for short, which is, which is a lot easier to say. Um, so basically, this is a change request um, to allow additional funding uh, into our programme from government. Um, it, we currently have an approval through Zebra to introduce 111 zero emission buses uh, across West Yorkshire. And um, this change request is to introduce an additional 25 electric buses. So that brings 136 um, to West Yorkshire from next March. Um, it's also to support some electric charging infrastructure for ZEBS as well. Um, and there's some carbon output benefits. So we're looking to remove 50, 50 plus tonnes of nitrogen oxides a year and over 7,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents by changing the buses from diesel to electric. Um, and we'll be phasing out the older model buses. The way the funding works is that government will pay the funding to bus operators to top up the difference in the cost between the diesel and the electric. And, and that's the, the mechanism for drawing down the funding. So this proposal is to work with first group to introduce these additional buses through the Bramley Depot in Leeds. Thank you. And it is pleasing to see those extra numbers. Um, happy to approve? Good stuff. Thank you. Okie dokie. So the further two schemes uh, were presented through the agreed delegation to Transport Committee at its meeting 7th of July for progression through the assurance process and approval for funding and presented in this report just for information. That's Active Travel Fund, Tranche 4 and Capability Fund and Dewsbury Cleckheaton Sustainable Travel Corridor. Thank you all so much. Moving swiftly on to the next item. I'm nearly there. Item 8C, Investment Priority 6, Culture and the Creative Industries, Sport and Physical Activity. This report provides details of two schemes recommended to the CA for progression through the assurance process. 
It's a, yet another investment into my Creative New Deal for West Yorkshire, and it's called You Can Make It Here Scheme, and it'll provide training and support to get people into the creative industries in our region, and it'll provide help to individuals and businesses with a bespoke range of initiatives, including training accelerators and mentorships. And I'm really delighted this support is being put into already growing sector. Almost 48,000 creative culture and sport roles were advertised in West Yorkshire in the last 12 months up to June 2023, a 17% rise on the previous year, three times greater than the national annual increase of 6%. So our focus on the creative industries is translating into jobs. The success we're seeing across our creative industries is just the start, with this investment cementing my ambition to give everyone a chance to gain the skills they need to progress to those well-paid jobs that they can love. The support we're providing is key to creating a greater, more diverse pool of talent and opportunities to help to drive further growth and innovation throughout the sector. And I'd like to invite Felix, uh, Director of Inclusive Economy, Skills and Culture, to outline the schemes for consideration. Thank you, Felix. Thank you very much, Claire. So you've got two schemes uh, presented in the paper in front of you. As the mayor just said, the first one refers to Bradford City of Culture 2025, seeking some funding from the combined authority to do two things, really. The first is to support the development of a business case, which will then come back. Um, and it's at that point that we will know how much funding is required from the combined authority and other partners to make this happen. So some of this funding will go toward the development of a business case uh, that our partners in Bradford will be leading. The second part of this will be to build capacity ahead of uh, the year of culture. This capacity funding and uh, board members today have spoken a fair bit about how important it is to build capacity in some of our key, among um, some of our key partners will focus on a small charitable and community uh, organizations to ensure they have the capacity to play a full part and to contribute to City of Culture 2025. So that is what this first uh, funding application is focusing on. Thank you, Felix. We'll just take that one there. And um, brilliant news for Bradford City of Culture with the money that they recently announced from DCMS and Heritage Funds and so on. So great fundraisers you've got in the team. So congratulations. And as uh, Felix said, this will unlock the next phase. Yes, Councillor Galton. Thanks, Mayor. Um, as you will appreciate, the performing arts is a specialist. Uh, sorry, and, and other artistic um, areas uh, is a specialist area and um, artists travel um, and when we're looking at things like city of culture and uh, capital of culture and whatever uh, you find that they also have specialists which travel from one festival to the next uh, what are we doing to ensure that the support we give to the creative industries isn't just attracting people from outside our region to come and live here and it's actually enabling jobs for people who already live here. My mission and my commitment to investing in the years of culture, and you will know there are five, is um, an assessment of the workforce that roll into the next one. So you could start in Leeds 2023 um, as an intern, and then by the time you've rolled through all the years of culture, you could be a producer at Bradford for City of Culture and then get a job at Channel 4. So absolutely, this is about homegrown and that's why the next project we'll come to is about that seed funding, that support for local people to make sure that they know that this sector is for them. So I spoke for you, Felix, but I am the chair of that committee. So I did feel like I had some skin in that game. Felix, anything you'd like to add? You've said it all, Mayor. Um, <laughs> we will. As the projects are developed and the business cases come through, we will get a lot more detail at that point, and I'm sure all of this will be tested. There are, and I don't want to go into um, too much technical stuff, but there are means by which we can estimate um, 
the extent to which people from outside the area might take part, might benefit, might contribute, et cetera. So I'm sure through the business case process, we'll be able to tease that out a bit more. Thank you. Councillor Hinchcliffe. Yeah, I think it's, it's worth reflecting, isn't it, really, that, you know, the cultural investment we do, um, we all love it. It is great. But it does lead to jobs. So I, was, I, I bumped into somebody the other week in Bradford, um, a young guy who goes Channel 4 in Leeds. He's now got a commission with Channel 4. Now, if Channel 4 had gone anywhere else in the country, would he have had the opportunity? Probably not, actually. So, you know, the, all that work we did, and we all, we've done Channel 4 now, it's here, so we're all getting used to it. However, it has long-lasting impact on our residents and opportunities for our residents. And, and that's what um, I want the UK City of Culture for Bradford to be as well, actually, uh, providing real opportunities for our residents on their doorstep opportunities, and obviously for the wider West Yorkshire as well. And I think, you know, it, it's going to be a really fantastic year of celebration and opportunity, for, particularly for our young people in Bradford. So we're really looking forward to it. It is an incredibly good news story today, those numbers about the employment being three times more than anywhere else in the country. Uh, Councillor Poulsen. Thank you. I'm sure this is something Councillor Hinchcliffe and I actually agree on, <laughs> on, the, on the City of Culture. But just on, on the grant funding, just some clarification. Will the grant funding be decided by the combined authority or is it going to BD25 to add into their pot for the existing grants that are being looked at? Felix. I'll do my best to answer, and if I get it wrong, I'll call my specialist behind me. Um, I said no tricky the, questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, <laughs> the, the two parts to this, as I said. So, the first part is about City of Culture. It's about supporting um, these small organizations uh, with some, some grants to build their capacity. The second part um, then focuses on how, how we uh, uh, build capacity in some of these other organizations. The detailed business case when it comes to, will I'm sure tease out that it's for Bradford City Council to actually determine how they do that uh, and, and the detail behind that and who, who has, uh, accesses that grant. Thank you so much. Unless Susan wants to add anything further? Well, obviously, largely it goes to the trust because that's the city, of that, that's where the pot of money is to commission the whole year. So. We're, we're all trying to get as much in there as possible to make it a fantastic year. Thank you. Okie doke. Moving on to um, the scheme, you can make it here, skills and business support for culture. Felix. Thank you very much, Mayor. This Sorry, we didn't approve that. My <laughs> mistake. Um, we're happy to approve the money for Bradford. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, Felix. Back to you. Thank you. This funding application uh, focuses on a raft of projects bundled within this program under the banner you can make it here and it's for skills <coughs> skills and business uh, support in the creative industries it focuses on a set of things as you can see set up set out in the paper a couple of them that I might sort of tease out right now for this conversation some of the funding will go towards improving accessibility for events and venues to make sure all our residents are able to take part and is, is to support skills training as well to make sure these venues are ready to support some of these uh, everybody who comes it's also focusing on freelancers and micro businesses these are really really important members of that community of that sector and who often are overlooked uh, when funding opportunities come through and don't often have the capacity to take part so there's a specific focus on freelancers here the Mayor's Screen Diversity Program will also benefit from this. Uh, we know that it's already quite a successful project um, and we're looking to make sure we can support that. And finally, uh, I'll tease out the knowledge exchange uh, bit of this. A lot of the time when we work through this, uh, maybe external consultants or others might come in and take their knowledge away. This is to ensure that proper knowledge exchange happens. Uh, there's some fancy words there, talent as escalators and others, but this is to make sure we can actually retain as much of the knowledge as possible uh, to improve how the sector operates. So that's, that's, what, that's what this uh, funding scheme is about. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. And we know that freelancers in particular have been hit hard during COVID and trying to support them 
going forward. Um, and, and they don't often always have those networks. So that's something that's really important and accessibility to venues. The Brood and L do a brilliant job, um, but we need more venues across the, across the piece. But also a screen diversity programme has been really, really successful in getting people into work from black, Asian, minority, ethnic back backgrounds, but people with disability, working class youngsters, really impactful. And we're looking to see how we can widen it to writers and writing, because uh, intellectual property is, is how you, if you just think about everyone's talking about Jamie, that was a young boy's story that turned into a, um, a, a, a theater piece that then became an international movie. We need to own our stories. So let's, we're looking at how we can widen out that opportunity as well. Are we happy to approve? We are, lovely. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Felix. Um, the rites of passage that is the first announcement to the CA, thank you. So moving on to item nine, govern governance arrangements. Um, so this provides members with an update on the process to seek new private sector members for the LEP board. These appointments form part of the process to integrate the LEP into the CA and maintain that strong public-private sector partnership we've developed. At the June LEP board meeting, the board had several private sector member vacancies. So a recruitment campaign started and um, uh, we were looking for individuals particularly who'd uh, reflect the diverse communities, businesses and geography of West Yorkshire. And I'm delighted that the appointments we're recommending cement the diversity of the board of the private sector member boards. We've got 10 women and three men. Um, and the appointments panel met with candidates last week and proposed the following appointments to the LEP board subject to completion of reference checks. Erin Holt, who works for Holson Limited, based in Kirklees. Annette Joseph, MBE, who works for Diverse and Equal, based in Leeds. Jane Atkinson, CBE, who works for Infinium, UK Limited, based in Wakefield. Lisa Johnson, who works for Starship Technologies, based in Leeds. Natalie Sykes, who works for James Wilby, based in Wakefield. Sharon Matthews, who works for AI Tech Limited, based in Leeds. And in addition, there are three existing private sector members who have successfully applied to be members of the LEP board. The first is Farah Bott, an existing private sector member of the Business Committee. Um, a furniture manufacturer, Nikki Chance Thompson, who is currently a co op opt member of the board and is made permanent. You'll know Nikki from the Peace Hall. And Asma Iqbal, brilliant lawyer, who currently is a co opted member of the board, also made permanent and is our inclusivity champion on the board. Can I ask Ben to add any further info um, and uh, uh, helpful maybe going forward about the business advisor? bit more of an update. No, thank you. So, so the only thing I would add is that um, if there was any lack of, um, uh, to just make it absolutely clear, so, so the Mayor is making these appointments as on a delegation from the previous meeting of the Local Enterprise Partnership back in June. Um, so these, the, the names that uh, the Mayor has read out, uh, they, were, they were fully expecting that this morning, so there's no surprises with those, with those individuals. Um, and that now brings the that the private sector contingent of the LEP board up to up to full strength, um, and we'll be looking to seek a meeting of those of those members later in the uh, in the summer so they can begin to um, uh, understand uh, their role. Um, the the process uh, you'll be aware there's a parallel process um, in terms of the, um, uh, the the mayor's business advisor who's also the LEP chair. Um, that process is still uh, is still live, um, and we'll report back on further details on that. Um, as I have been doing, keeping in touch through email correspondence to all CA members, and we'll continue to do that through the summer. Thank you. Thank you, and it was very um, reassuring uh, and uplifting to see that so many uh, business leaders want to be part of the journey for uh, the Combined Authority and want to use their experience to add value and to give something back. So it was really uh, great to see, and we have a fantastic um, we, it isn't a LEP anymore, is it? We're, we're struggling with the, the business committee or an opportunity board. Or we, 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 it needs a new title, I think. Um, but I'm really pleased to see that diversity as well. And we are happy to note and approve. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, Okie doke. So um, we have the minutes for information. Uh, you have them in the pack. Thank you, everyone, 
for attending today. Can I wish you all a restful, peaceful summer? Because uh, it's going to be quite interesting when we get back from September. Potentially, obviously, my election, maybe a general election next year. And going to uh, the next steps for bus franchising, mass transit, etc. It's going to be a, a really exciting place to live. Thank you all for coming. And the next meeting is 7th of September 2023. Thank you.